When we first walked through how to set up an IP phone with asterisk in an earlier chapter, we touched on the topic of device naming conventions. We'll spend some time now giving a more thorough look at that topic. We'll start by talking about the limitations enforced by asterisk, and then recommend some best practices. Finally, we'll examine several common device naming strategies looking at strengths and weaknesses of each. There are three primary requirements asterisk will enforce when it comes to device naming. First, device names in Asterisk need to be unique on each Asterisk system for each protocol. You can use the same device name on more than one Asterisk server, but each server can only use a particular device name once per protocol. If you try to use the same device name more than once on the same system, Asterisk will treat both entries as referring to a single device and may not behave in the way you expect. This means that you could use a device name of trunk in both sip.conf and eeks.conf, and they would refer to different devices, However, if you try to specify two devices named trunk and sip.conf, asterisk will treat both instances as referring to the same actual device. Secondly, proper device names consist of up to 79 characters, including letters, numbers, spaces, and special characters. Finally, device names set in asterisk need to match the name configured on the actual device. Depending on the protocol in use, there may be settings for the channel driver in asterisk that can override the name set in the section heading. Just remember that in order for authentication to take place, asterisk and the other device need to match the name and other credentials. When in doubt, look at the protocol debugging messages or a packet capture to confirm authentication names. The previous slide covered only the requirements for asterisk device naming. We intentionally didn't make any mention of best practices related to device names. We'll talk now about some of the things we recommend doing or avoiding to keep your system secure and easy to maintain. Though asterisk can support device names up to 79 characters long, the device might only support 16 or 32 characters. We recommend keeping device names under 16 characters long for this reason. Some devices may not permit special characters even though asterisk does, so we also recommend against using them in your device names. The same is true for the space character. The device may not support it, so we recommend leaving it out of the device names. The asterisk CLI can also get confused by a device name with a space in it. It can still work properly, but it can be needlessly complicated to troubleshoot or administer. Asterisk treats device configuration for each channel driver or VoIP protocol separately, so it's possible to have the same device name configured for more than one channel driver on the same system. For example, you could have a device named Phone1 defined for SIP and another device named Phone1 defined for EECS. These represent two different devices that have no direct relationship to each other because they're using different protocols. This doesn't confuse asterisk, but it is likely to confuse an administrator, so we recommend against using the same device name with multiple protocols on the same system. We also recommend against using device names that look confusingly similar. The letter O looks like the digit 0, and the letters I and L can look like the digit 1, so a device name of LO might look very similar to a device named 1-0. Avoiding this could save some headaches down the road. We're often asked for recommendations on naming schemes to use to simplify or standardize device naming. We'll look at several common methods, but before we do, we want to point out that there's not a right or wrong way to name devices. Each of the approaches we'll mention has advantages and disadvantages, so we'll want to look at each one from a few different angles. Security can be an important consideration for large asterisk systems on the public internet or that route international calls, but might be less important for smaller systems on a private network that only handle internal call routing. In some installations, maintenance effort is a more important consideration than security. Your mileage may vary. The first naming method we'll look at matches the device name to the dial plan extension that rings the device. These are almost always strictly numerical device names. This method has the advantage that it's easy to remember a particular device name, but that may or may not be very useful. Despite its popularity, this method has a few significant disadvantages. Tightly coupling device naming and dial plan mapping reduces flexibility by making it a more involved process to change either. Additionally, this method isn't as secure as some other approaches. It's often easy for a potential attacker to learn someone's extension from a company directory, business card, or other social engineering. If they can infer from the extension the device name of a phone on your system, they can try to brute force guess the password for that device. Decoupling device names from extension names is one way to prevent this, though there are also other ways. Another common naming method is to assign device names based on the name or title of the person using the device, or based on physical location. 
The phone in Alice's office might be named Alice, while other phones might be named receptionist or courtesy phone. This approach suffers from the same basic disadvantages as mapping device names to dial plan extensions. Security is low because device names can be guessed, and maintenance effort is somewhat high. Device names don't have to be updated every time the dial plan changes, but they do need to change when employees or phones get reassigned. That can be just as bad. A somewhat more secure device naming method uses the device MAC address, basically a serial number for the network interface of the phone or trunk. MAC addresses are harder to guess, but if a potential attacker can get network access or physical access to a phone, you could still be compromised. The maintenance effort when using this method is about as low as possible. If a phone needs to be replaced, you'll have to update asterisk so it knows the MAC address of the new phone, but you'd probably have to look at the asterisk configuration when setting up a new phone anyway. Remember that the configuration on the device must match asterisk configuration for the device, so the incremental maintenance effort for using this method is minimal. The last naming method we'll discuss involves using a strong password as the device name as well as its password. Passwords for VoIP devices should always be strong and include a combination of letters, numbers, and valid special characters. This method suggests setting up the username for the device as a secure string that looks like a password as well. Of course, we said earlier that using special characters in the device name is not recommended, and we stand by that. But you can still make a relatively strong username by alternating uppercase and lowercase letters with digits and the underscore and dash characters. This device naming strategy improves security by making it harder for an attacker to brute force their way into unauthorized access. On most systems, if a valid username is known, it's only a matter of time until the password is guessed. If an attacker has to properly guess both the username and the password, it will take exponentially longer on average to break in. Of course, the username and the password should never be the same string if security is a concern. The security in this naming method relies on both the device name and its password consisting of different strong passwords. Network and physical access can still undermine the security of this method. Some phones have on-screen menus that can be used to display the username, and unencrypted network traffic will show the device name in plain text for SIP and EECS. It's a good idea to disable or password protect the menus on your phones that display the device name. Note that the passwords to access a configuration of a phone via its web interface or LCD screen are usually different than the authentication password the phone will use when registering or making calls. It's worth considering encrypting your VoIP calls, especially if they're routed over the public internet. As we've said, there's no clear right or wrong way to name your VoIP devices. Our goals in this module were to teach you what naming requirements Asterisk enforces, offer some best practices related to device naming, and to introduce several common naming methods. You should now be equipped to decide for yourself the best approach to device naming for your environment. Next, we'll move on to discuss the topic of VoIP registration.